around January, February 2020, you know, when people began getting infected, there are people that have been sick since then. And if long COVID is anything like ME-CFS, my guess is that some people will just not recover and they'll have it for the rest of their life. I'm Greg Running, And I'm Rob Reeford. And this is Mind Body Matters. Welcome. This is the podcast where we discuss all matters of the mind and body and the mind connection. Hey, Rob, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. Did you have a good week? Not bad. Not bad. But I think, uh, I have to be honest with you, I, I'm tired. You're tired. You, you just kind of sound tired. Yeah. I am tired. Um, I have chronic fatigue syndrome. <laughs> Are you sure you do? Well, I... <laughs> because we're going to be talking about that, but... But it's yeah. an interesting thing. It's an interesting point is that, I mean, how do we know that we're just tired? How do we know we don't have mononucleosis, right? How do we know that we don't have something really seriously wrong with us, you know? But it is a good point. I, I have never, uh, at least to my knowledge, I don't think I've ever had mono in my life. But now I'm raising questions. I'm wondering if it's mono... If it's long COVID syndrome or whatever they call it. I think a lot of people are wondering if they have long COVID. And if you remember when we were talking about putting the podcast together, we noticed how curious we are about a, a number of things. One, you remember we were talking one time about the full moon? Well, yeah. <laughs> what is it about the full moon that makes people go crazy? Right. And then at that time, I remember you asking me, do you know what long COVID is? And, and I said, like, I read about it. I heard about it in the news, but I have no idea what it is. And that got, that got us thinking that that's, that's a topic. That's something we can talk about in a podcast. So today, after your research and you were looking into long COVID for me, you stumbled upon our special guest today. Yes, he's a, a leading researcher in, well, first of all, I should say he's a leading researcher in chronic fatigue syndrome, like you were alluding to there. So that's called M-E-C-F-S now. So chronic fatigue syndrome is kind of like a derogatory term. But I remember years and years ago, back then they, they used to refer to this whole thing as the Epstein-Barr virus. Yeah. And, and that's just part of it. You know, that person has Epstein-Barr, that person has chronic fatigue, and it was kind of questionable if it was psychological, you know. So he's been researching that for 40 years. So here's a guy that really knows his stuff regarding M-E-C-F-S, chronic fatigue. So I've you know, a number of questions to kind of find out exactly what long COVID is, but a really, really interesting guy. He's mm -hmm. uh, a professor of psychology and director of the Center for Community Research at DePaul University in Chicago. He's published over 500 journal articles, written over 20 books, including a recent one we'll talk about in which he was the main editor, uh, Understanding the Behavioral and Medical Impact of Long COVID. I read that thoroughly, got tons of questions about that. Dr. Leonard Jason, who's uh, our guest today, is recognized as one of the leading experts in the current study of long COVID. And as the producer, Rob, you're going to be listening in on this. And at the end, we're going to talk about all of this and a very, very long, in-depth way of answering that question from a, from a while ago. What exactly is long COVID? We're about to find out, I guess. We're about to find out. Dr. Leonard Jason, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for the invitation. I know you've been busy lately with uh, a lot of media interviews, so I really appreciate the time you set aside today. Happy to do so. I've had the uh, pleasure of reading your books about the research on long COVID and especially enjoyed reading about your early life and experiences before your graduate studies, before you became a psychologist. So I'm going to dive in deep here and ask you a serious question right off the, the start. What was it like seeing Bob Dylan at the Isle of Wight Festival in 1969? <laughs> well, he had just come out of retirement after a kind of motorcycle accident a couple of years before that. And he was certainly one of my heroes and seeing him on stage was pretty amazing. And seeing all the people, really thousands of people grooving to his music uh, was something you'll never forget. This is almost like as big as Woodstock, right? They had over 100,000 people there? Yeah, very, very, very comparable, except the weather was better. <laughs> ah, <laughs> no mud. <laughs> yeah. And the Who were there too. Are you a Who fan? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, there were just one, one amazing band after another. 
you know, something that I, I just happened to be there at the right time. I hadn't planned it at all. Amazing. What was your favorite part of it? I think uh, just seeing people that uh, I'd heard on records in the States from uh, so many years before that. Yeah. Absolutely. Our focus is on the mind and body, right? The uh, emotional health and physical health. What does the mind-body connection mean to you? Basically, this means that thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and attitudes can either positively or negatively affect our, our body, our biology. And for me, the concept of mindfulness is really key, and that includes awareness, connection, insight, and purpose. And this type of state of mindfulness includes just where kind of, in a sense, we're in a non-reactive state. We're ready to, in a sense, moderate that brain activity in the limbic area. We're just basically in a mindful kind of point of view. I, uh, I, I totally agree about the mindfulness part. It helps to connect the mind and body for sure. So I have a lot of questions about your research. We won't go through all of them, but we're going to talk about long COVID. But first, I'd like to talk about your book, Experiencing Sacredness, a Psycho-Spiritual Journey. It's a real sure. departure from your books on research. Yes. This was um, kind of more of a memoir about a trip that I took through many countries when I just graduated college in 1971. This was the summer of 71 that you, uh, you first went to Europe first, right? I landed in London and hitchhiked through Europe and went through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan into India. Yeah. What, what inspired you to do this on your own? You didn't go with anybody. Trying to find out what would bring me fulfillment and what I wanted to become. I knew that the answer didn't lie behind a desk or a book or with a degree. Kind of a time in my life where I was trying to um, really think about the next stage. I just got my bachelor's degree and Eastern religions I'd read about had become appealing to me. They hinted at a way of approaching life with a certain reverence for the here and now, regardless of the circumstances. Later on, we're going to talk about meditation and its, uh, its impact on our health. And you have some research about that. But did you learn meditation when you were there or did you know about meditation before you left? I had been doing some practice of it before I actually uh, started that trip to India. In your book, I noticed that you spent a, a good part of a chapter on your father's career. I sense that your relationship with your parents and especially your dad was part of the reason why you went on the trip to kind of understand them and you better. So Jay Jason, famous comedian, but he was your father. What was it like being a son and being around show business and entertainers when you're younger? So I was surrounded, as you said, by singers, comedians, jugglers, magicians, memory experts, and that's a very atypical environment. <laughs> And people like Dave Fry practice Richard Dixon imitations, and um, I can visualize Jackie Mason, Corbett Monica, Don Rickles trying their latest comedy routines in our living room. And my dad knew people like Woody Allen and even Marilyn Monroe. So yeah, there there were lots of uh, um, entertainment, and it it certainly was a, a living environment different from most most kids. You were young, like, did you enjoy that when, like, Don Rickles would come over or discussions about the Catskill Mountains? Uh, was that an interest for you or was it kind of boring for you as a kid? I was really not that interested in kind of the entertainment world. I was more interested, I guess, in kind of personal relationships. So um, for me, kind of psychology was uh, more interesting than kind of individuals who were entertaining. In your book, you said your father was a powerful figure and demanded attention. How did that affect you? As you said, my dad was witty, bright, very well connected. He had power and people who have power, um, in a sense, um, see the world differently um, compared to those who don't. My dad was pleased when he was the centerpiece um, this was reinforced by the public who provided him support and approval. So, but my dad's temper passed on from his own family and his need to be the center of attention made it sometimes difficult for 
um, my mother to have a separate and independent identity. And eventually she would actually collapse emotionally. And, and for me, part of my struggles was trying to understand that as well. And my trip to India was really gave me the time to not just reflect on a voyage that went all the way to through 14 countries, but also a time to strip myself of all resources and just be able to think about um, what I'd had been experiencing through my kind of life up to that point. I certainly can relate to your story in the book about parents and family. And it seemed that later on, you, you kind of resolved the conflict you're talking about, the temper and all that. Uh, how, how were you able to do that? You know, it's a long process. And certainly, I think forgiveness of oneself and forgiveness of others is probably critical. Um, later on, um, I think Robert Bly, in his book, Iron John, really summarized the two tendencies in our fathers. If we adopt psychological thinking toward our father, we can bring out ourselves forgiveness, um, humor, um, compassion. We can bring that out of ourselves and our heart begins to melt. We can understand how little love our fathers got. If we take this childhood traumas into account, no father will be good all the way. So it's basically recognizing we all have flaws and how do we appreciate both the good and bad parts of everyone. Probably the biggest realization I had in my life is that my parents did the best they could with what they had. Exactly. Yeah. That's what one ultimately kind of, I think, learns. And um, yeah, I agree. More about the trip. When we talked a few days ago, you told me the first influential teacher on your trip was a London bank guard. Why, why a bank guard? Well, I flew into London. I just had a bunch of maps. I really had no kind of uh, clear way of how I was going to get to India. But when one's 22, one's kind of thinking one can do anything. And, uh, but I needed to get some money and I went to uh, one of the British banks and, and as I walked in, I saw the guard kind of just sort of saying hello to everybody, eyeing them. And I just started watching the guard. He smiled at every person that walked by him. He was like every moment seemed to be inspirational, seemed to be important. And as I thought about it, it became clear to me that even if one has a job that's routine or literally even maybe boring, one can bring something to it and one can bring a specialness in that moment's important. And, and I think sometimes in these trips that we take, sometimes something happens very early. And if we pay attention to it, it can have a profound effect on kind of what we think about ourselves and the world. And that particular interaction did affect me. I'll never forget it. And when I walked out of the bank after kind of watching him for several minutes, I said to myself, I didn't need to talk to him. I didn't need to get to know him, but I knew him and I knew what he was about. And I knew that he was kind of honoring the moment. And I said, that's what I'm gonna do for my whole summer trip and try to do it the rest of my life, to take each moment and put a smile on my face. And, and as I walked out the bank, I began to smile at different people and say hello. And people greeted me with a smile and hello. And that basically became an opening for all the different cultures and communities and people that I met through my 14 countries that I was about to travel through. Honoring the moment. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. It seems like he was living in the here and now. He must have found a way to do that. Exactly. Um, and that's really, I think, what all the different spiritual traditions ultimately talk about, as I would learn as I began to meet some of these spiritual leaders in my travels. You learned a lot about Buddhism. Uh, what specifically did you learn? Well, Buddhism spoke about releasing us from the enchantment of Maya or illusion. By breaking through the limitations of ego, we might behold a paradise where one has a sense of compassion and empathy for the terror and suffering that are part of this world and where we might be free. So during my trip, I would have a chance to talk with those who practice these types of Eastern religions, find out from them what answers they might provide to me. Mind Body Matters is brought to you by Audible and the hidden power of shadow work. Hi, listeners. I have something to share with you. 
I've read a lot of self-help books, but there's one book that I found really helpful for me personally, The Hidden Power of Shadow Work by Marcus Black. In the book, I found the part of ourselves that we'd rather forget is what's called your shadow self. I know it sounds ominous, but it isn't. By doing the shadow work exercises in this book, I learned how to understand and even embrace that part of myself. There's six activities and questions on how to discover, identify, and get to know your shadow self. If you're ready to master your shadow and start healing from within, then get the paperback or Kindle edition of The Hidden Power of Shadow Work by Marcus Black. Go to Amazon.com. By the way, I like the book so much I narrated the audiobook myself. True story. It's available on Audible from Google Play and the App Store. This is Mind Body Matters. Now back to our interview with Dr. Leonard Jason. I was really struck by the amount of people who had really, really strong opinions of America at that time. And like you said, this is 1971. Did that give you a different perspective on the States when you're talking with them? There was the war on Vietnam going on. A lot of people were kind of angry about that. There was a war on drugs that the president at the time, Nixon, was instigating. So there were a lot of wars and there was a lot of kind of ugly American kind of materialistic kind of notion. And so I did get um, people who kind of had mixed feelings. They really respected kind of what was going on in our country, but they also had feelings that there were a lot of problems. And by myself really being close to the, the ground without having a f camera or without having anything but kind of a knapsack in my back, I think they accepted me and were willing to share with me probably things about my country that uh, they might not tell a lot of tourists. Right, right. What was your takeaway from their perspective? That um, we had a mixed re reputation among the people that I met. And a lot of folks felt that um, materialism was really the dominant kind of focus of our world and their worlds were kind of different. Talking about materialism, you, um, you lost your money. Uh, you, in Turkey, you lost your traveler's checks. So <laughs> did that kind of force you to kind of live without materialism? Yeah, I, I basically in Turkey had my traveler's checks stolen. And by the way, uh, um, when I tried to get the money back, Travelers Express had all types of problems giving it to me. I got it back when I came back to the United States. So I was really, I had about $100, and I really spent the entire summer on that amount of money. And uh, I had to be very careful. Um, and as, as, you, as you know, I hitchhiked through many of the countries, and, and people were very kind and offered me all types of um, opportunities for kind of staying places and food so I was able to live inexpensively but by being that close to the land I and the people and the cultures I was really able to get a I think a unique perspective not only stripping myself of resources and money but also of you know just having the time you know spending 15 20 hours on my own during the day as I was traveling um, trying to uh, you know Get, get on my way to India. I love the book. I related to it so much. So thank you for, for writing it. And I'm going to mention later on for people and put the link to find the book in our description for the podcast. Let's talk about uh, the research on PASC and MECFS. So uh, first, can you describe what PASC is? Sure. We can think of it as long COVID. That's probably the more common name for it and people who have been affected, infected with SARS-CoV-2, and if this, the symptoms do not resolve in about three months, they call it um, long COVID. And most people with um, SARS-CoV-2 remain asymptomatic, but some experience mild symptoms, maybe about 40% um, more moderate symptoms, but 15% develop severe COVID-19 and had an 18 month follow-up of those with symptomatic infections, about 6% had not recovered, and 42% had recovered only partially. So there's a lot of people who have some symptoms, and a very small percentage, about that 6%, have very severe symptoms. Thank you for that. Uh, do we know 
How many people worldwide have long COVID? As of April of 2023, about 760 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. 760 million. Wow. Are people aware that we're at that point where there's so many uh, people have long COVID? So that these are the number of people that have cases of COVID-19. Oh, I um, see. I see what you're saying. And, okay. and, and in terms of cases of long COVID, again, the, the figure will probably vary depending on what percentage that you think of in terms of, you know, mild, moderate, or severe. But if you even take 10% of that group, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, yeah. Who, who can get long COVID? We're beginning to find out clues about this. There's a higher risk of long COVID in those with more severe initial infection, but long COVID can occur even among the mild, mildly infected. And risk factors for developing long COVID include certain autoantibodies, diabetes, type 2, obesity, high blood pressure, chronic lung disease, and even something called the Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mono. Do we know how long COVID would last for somebody? Does it last a few months or a few years? Or So since around January, February 2020, you know, when people began getting infected, there are people that have been sick since then. And if long COVID is anything like ME-CFS, my guess is that some people will just not recover and they'll have it for the rest of their life. What are the main symptoms that people should look for? Because I'm sure a lot of people read you know, read about these symptoms online, but what would you suggest people look for? So this virus affects the respiratory system, but it can have effects at the kidneys, gastrointestinal tract, heart, and brain. So because this SARS-CoV-2 can go throughout the entire body, um, symptoms include things like fatigue, brain fog, post-exertional malaise, but there's hundreds of possible symptoms and um, just about anything you can imagine seems to occur with some patients. What uh, misconceptions are on the media? Well, um, some people feel that they go into the physician and their blood counts are negative. They can't see any kind of um, pathology. No, they can't see what the reasons are. And, and there's a tendency for healthcare professionals to then uh, kind of conclude that this is a psychogenic, you know, psychological illness. And, you know, the reality is that this is something that if you have a major medical illness, yeah, you might have some, you know, psychological overlay on top of that. You might get depressed if you lose your ability to go to work and have difficulty socializing. But the reality is these are people who are, you know, have a medical illness and it's biologically based. MECFS. Can you let listeners know what that stands for and how long you've been researching it? ME stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis, CFS for chronic fatigue syndrome, and patients with this illness call it MECFS. So that's what it's called. And basically, um, it has very comparable symptoms for people with long COVID. And again, the classic symptoms are post exertional malaise cognitive impairment, unrefreshing sleep, but there are some differences. And people with MECFS had cold limbs and they have flu-like symptoms. They generally don't occur with long COVID. And people with long COVID sometimes have hair loss and that generally doesn't occur with MECFS. So there are some unique differences, but the vast majority of symptoms, there's tremendous overlap. So I could see what, why you're a leading researcher on long COVID because there's this correlation between long COVID and MECFS. Are we getting to a point where it's conclusive that it's related to that, or are we still doing research to redefine long COVID? Something about maybe 40% would be diagnosed with MECFS. So there is a yeah, good, good overlap. And again, we know that with long COVID, SARS-CoV-2 infection can reactivate latent viruses like the Epstein-Barr virus. And the Epstein-Barr virus causes mono, and mono is one of the um, causes for MECFS. So there's lots of kind of parallels, um, but certainly some individuals who have pure MECFS, it's often caused by um, something like a viral infection. It could be mono, the Epstein-Barr virus, um, whereas those with long COVID it's SARS-CoV-2 that started it off. So 
there's different things that precipitate the illnesses, but I think the consequences tend to be very similar. The COVID-19 virus uh, precipitated long COVID, but is it COVID? Or <laughs> like, it's, is that a misnomer that we're calling it long COVID? There's, there's probably uh, maybe 20 different case definitions, and, and this is the same problem that occurred with MECFS, where it has lots of different names and different case definitions, but ultimately you want to reach some kind of consensus. So I think long COVID is probably what most people call it around the world, but it does have other names, um, long haul, PASC, and, and many other things. Is this a second epidemic? Uh, how do you feel about that? In the U.S., there are over 120,000 new cases and 1,700 deaths caused by COVID each week. And only about 17% have updated booster doses. So I would say that the pandemic, um, I think it still is occurring and it's still causing all types of havoc in our healthcare system. Um, certainly less than occurred a couple of years ago, but it still is a major threat. This conceivably could be an upcoming epidemic. Do I have that right? We don't know which new variant is coming out, so it could very likely be that something new happens that can change all the um, projections that these different agencies are making. So I think we have to kind of stay close to kind of watching what's going on. But certainly people are still getting infected. People are still dying every week. Tell me about your journal article, Understanding the Behavioral and Medical Impact of Long COVID. When we talked earlier, you said it's a guide for healthcare practitioners. So this, this is actually kind of a book. It was in international scholars, 15 different people, different groups around the world. And they are, they've written a book that just got released by Rutledge, which is an off print of Taylor and Francis available on different types of websites and describes what is known in different areas of functioning affected by long COVID and how this knowledge can facilitate the appreciation of appropriate assessment and treatment. And there are clear benefits that can occur when multidisciplinary approaches can help better understand the complicated behavioral and medical systems of those affected by long COVID. How does this affect the brain? We, we, we talk a lot about mind and body, so we're, you know, we're obviously we're talking about the impact on the body, but I imagine this is a huge impact on the brain as well. We've been looking at um, brain scans, and it does appear it does affect the brain, both in terms of blood flow and structure. Um, and it's one of the most disabling symptoms of this so-called attack on the brain. So yes, it's, it's very important and there's a lot of research that's going on in this area. I understand that it's called neurocognitive impairment or some people call it brain fog, is that right? Yeah, the lingering symptoms involve difficulty thinking and it might be caused by ongoing low grade brain inflammation following the acute viral infection. Um, and even individuals with initial mild COVID symptoms may be vulnerable. How would you describe brain inflammation? What this inflammatory immune system, which is what we're talking about, is response to the virus. And what occurs is that you have injury to the blood vessels, a lack of oxygen in the brain, and that may account for some of the diagnostic images that show changes in brain's white matter that contains the long nerve fibers, which transfer information from one brain region to another. So it's sometimes called diffuse white matter disease. And that might basically contribute to these cognitive difficulties. Now moving to your journal article, Mindfulness Meditation Interventions for Long COVID. In that, I read that there's mind-body trials for patients with ME-CFS. Can you tell me more about that research, what mind-body trials are? For many years, you have people looking at mind-body research. And it's thought of as a remedy for symptoms of fatigue cognitive dysfunction, and you can actually, through meditation, bring about structural and functional changes to the brain. And myself and Nicole Porter and some others about 10 years ago reviewed all the different complementary and alternative trials directed at treating patients with MECFS. 
And it turns out that um, meditation was about the most helpful. So we do think that there's good evidence. And since then, of course, there's been research uh, about patients with long COVID. How do we know that meditation works for this? Mindfulness practices, which include breath regulation, can influence components of the immune system. And actually, there's research suggesting that long-term meditators, those who have meditated for more than three years, experience enhanced psychological well-being. So, and even short-term structured programs seem to have some positive effects. So yes, there's actually a, a research literature that this type of approach meditation can have effects on, on actually some of the same issues that are occurring within MECFS and long COVID to the brain. How long does someone have to be in meditation for it to be effective? If a person is starting to do this, they might try maybe even five minutes to just see how comfortable they are doing it. Maybe work up to 10 minutes, maybe do it twice a week, maybe work up to 20 minutes a day, twice a week, twice a day. Certainly, the longer you do it, the, probably the, the better the effects. But certainly, even an eight or 12 week sequence has good results, suggesting that there's not just quality of life positive effects and things like fatigue as well, but there's actually changes that occur in different parts of the body. I read in the article there's an alpha state during meditation. What is an alpha state? So if you're in an alpha state, your brain is relaxed and you don't have intentional goal-oriented tasks. So this is generally a sign of deep relaxation. For those with long COVID, what can they do on their own to feel empowered? Are there any exercises that they could do? There's something called a four, seven, eight technique. That's a relaxation exercise that involves breathing in four counts, holding that breath for seven counts and exhaling for eight counts. So that's one of the more simple exercises. Something else that people can try is called breath regulation meditation. It's also known as breath counting task. And this is part of Zen Buddhism. It's a meditation technique that involves controlling and regulating breathing patterns. So there's a person named Moore who basically wrote a manual about how one does this. And I'll just go through it real quickly. If you get into a, if you can sit in a meditation posture, um, breathing through the nostrils, one brings their attention completely to that. The core of the method is unite the mind with the exhalations by counting them. So whenever one inhales, one just relaxes and remains present. Um, simply be aware of the whole body sensation of inhaling. But when one exhales, counting each exhalation mentally to oneself, one, and then to the next exhalation, two, and so on, until you're counted nine exhalations. And when you reach nine, return to one, repeat the cycle. So that's a very simple way of kind of starting a meditation practice. Being a meditation practitioner myself, and I studied Zen Buddhism for a while, I certainly can relate to the breath practice and the benefits of it. What have patients told you about this exercise? What are they experiencing? Individuals who have long COVID, people who have ME-CFS, um, an example is eight weeks of using this technique that I just talked about will lead to significant increase in levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines and decrease in levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the effects of these breathing techniques on cytokine levels and immune system responses in health, healthy volunteers have been found in a number of studies. Um, so practicing these specific breath control techniques can lead to significant increases in anti-inflammatory cytokines and decreases in pro-inflammatory cytokines. So in a sense, what you're doing is your body is coming back to a homeostasis. It's coming back to a balance. And that's what patients report, that as they get calm and as they relax and as they continue to meditate, they begin to have less of some of these types of somatic symptoms we've been talking about. That's amazing. Amazing. 
Looking ahead, what are the most promising areas of research? I think we need to go into the deep structures of the brain, things like the amygdala. We need to find out exactly what is going on there. You know, it's interesting. There's a thing called kindling that is an explanation for things like epilepsy. Um, so something very low level of stimulation gets the brain into a seizure. Well, what might be occurring is that the same type of kindling occurs within something in the brain where very low levels of stimulation ends up having something in the brain become maybe not a seizure, but kind of a some type of a rupture of different types of transmissions. And if that is occurring, what you want to do is figure out ways of relaxing the brain. And the best thing you can do is the types of strategies we've talked about, but anything that puts one into a deep seated relaxation is probably healthy for the brain and the body. Things like MRIs and fMRIs and even quantitative EEGs will be able to document where the problem is and then how to bring about some changes in it. Mind Body Matters is brought to you by Pivot Design Group. Whether using an app, scrolling through a website, or looking at a logo, for many, design is a mystery. Who and how decided that something should work or look like that? Pivot Design Group takes the mystery out of design. Specializing in healthcare, Pivot uses a unique process called informed design. This insightful and data-based framework informs every design decision to create effective and sustainable experiences and services. To learn more, visit www.pivot.design. And now, back to the show. There's a, a lot of stigma still about CFSM. I mean, a lot of misunderstanding. What do you think needs to be done to raise awareness to promote understanding of this? I think that we need to respect each person's journey that they're on, and we have to legitimize their complaints that they have. And I don't think we want to sort of question their motives or question their experience of illness. I think we need to sort of develop a partnership with our patients and believe in them. And I think that's probably um, a very important part of any type of therapeutic relationship. The doctor, patient, therapist, client, I mean, one needs to sort of have that person feel they can be trusted, they can be believed, they're comfortable and they're willing to explore. So I do think that trust is critically important. And also we need to sort of recognize that the patients with long COVID and ME-CFS actually have probably a tremendous amount of knowledge because they've been reading all the medical journals. <laughs> so they're coming in to this kind of relationship often sometimes having more information than the healthcare practitioner. So it's really an alliance that each of them learns from each other. And I think that type of partnership is really what we think of the next stage of medicine. Thank you so much for that feedback. Uh, winding down here, last few questions. What recommendations do you have for our listeners regarding long COVID and how can they learn more about it? Things are changing very quickly in this world. Um, in the United States, there was over a billion dollars that had been set aside for what's called the Recover kind of initiatives around 30 different hubs around the country. So there's a tremendous amount of research that's going on. There's hundreds of scientists throughout the world that are participating in this exercise of gathering information, learning from their patients, and doing basic research. So I would expect that these unexplained illnesses are going to be get a big leap forward in our understanding of them. You know, 80% of back pain is unexplained. When you go to the primary care, 20-30% of patients are dealing with issues that it's unclear why they have fatigue and pain. So these unexplained illnesses um, are really something that's in the kind of forefront of medicine. So as we get understanding of long COVID and ME-CFS, we're gonna have insights that are gonna basically revolutionize the practice of medicine. So yes, we're very good at treating broken bones, but in terms of trying to deal with 
kind of the issues that we're dealing with these pandemics and these post-viral conditions were just the beginning stages of understanding. Going back to your experience in 71 on your trip, what advice would you give to someone who's struggling with who they are or seeking meaning and purpose in life? People are trying to discover their route. Guides will come to us and they'll basically provide us some insights. It's our willingness and openness to kind of listen to that and basically help us as we sort of navigate through often kind of a mist. And, you know, the Buddhists kind of talk about this Maya, you know, how we basically see through it and basically try to sort of recognize that there is a path, there is a way out of both illness and through, there's also a path through the struggles that, you know, we often deal with just in the life, living life. And we can gain so much by being open to the experience, by being mindful of what's in front of us and not preoccupied with being in the past or the future, but just being in the present and honoring that. Earlier, you mentioned that a lot of people are doing a lot of reading. Maybe, you know, they're educating themselves more than the doctors, but, and I'll put a lot of uh, links in the uh, podcast description, but what are key resources out there for people that want to know more about long COVID and find out if they have it or not? You know, certainly there's, you know, the book that we just published, which had 15 experts and they could probably get that at a library or if they want to purchase it, it's the soft cover. It's not that expensive, but that gives an overview of most basic research in 15 different parts of the body um, and what we know about things and what can be done for some of these different areas like cognitive issues. For those who are interested in the more meditation aspects, which we think of as something that can be helpful when you have these types of illnesses, there's, there's a number of resources. I'll just mention a couple of them. If you're interested in something called the Mindfulness Adherence Questionnaire, it's a way of measuring the frequency and quality of informal mindfulness practices. It's called MAQ. There's the Mindful Attention Awareness Scale, and that's a 15-item measure of present moment awareness. And there's the five-facet mindfulness questionnaire, and that's designed to assess mindfulness across the five dimensions, acting with awareness, observing, describing, non-reactivity, and non-judging. Um, at the Paul University, we actually developed something called the Foundational Value Scale, and that basically measures things like harmony, warmth, intelligence, concern and reverence for the environment, and spirituality, which consists of living a spiritual life and having a fellowship or union with God. So, so yes, there's lots of different instruments that are out there that people can either take themselves or use for research purposes. It's wonderful that the research you're doing and uh, your colleagues are looking at not just the physical, right? So it, it, what you're describing here is mind, body, and spirit. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to, uh, to hear that. Well, listeners, uh, Dr. Jason's books to check out are Experiencing Sacredness, A Psycho-Spiritual Journey, Understanding the Behavioral and Medical Impact of Long COVID, and the journal article, Mindfulness Meditation Interventions for Long COVID, and I'll list these in the description for the episode. Where are your books available? One can get the books east, probably the most easily through kind of websites like Amazon. Wonderful. And I understand you have an audio book too. Yeah, actually, um, I did a audio recording of, of my memoir and that's available also on uh, Amazon. Uh, Amazon and Audible, yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing your personal experiences and your research. Thank you. All the best. Wow. Great interview. It was. Dr. Leonard Jason. You'll have to excuse me for a second. I was just uh, in the middle of doing my... <laughs> deep breathing. <laughs> deep breathing exercises. I, I, I was... <laughs> yeah, a lot of deep breathing on this show. But no, I was breathing in through my nostrils. You, you had done that before. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I, I've really not got into uh, meditation and, and so on, but you have. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool that he was talking about uh, a type of Zen Buddhist uh, meditation that, that I've done for many years. And the breath practice that he talked about, 
uh, is part and parcel with Zen Buddhism. So exactly that, you know, counting, the, the counting of the breath is, uh, is all about Zen Buddhism. But what's really cool about what he said is that that can actually help the physical illnesses that we're talking about today, that it actually has an impact on the brain, not just in a psychological way, but in a physical way, changing the structure in that. But uh, yeah, I think that was a very interesting coincidence that, that he talked about something that I'm, I'm very, very familiar with. Uh, as you mentioned, um, he's got a new book out right now. It's, it, as you said, it's more of a memoir. Uh, by the way, I had to laugh when you were talking about Bob Dylan back years Man. ago. Yeah. yeah. He actually went, uh, this is back in the, I think it was early 70s. Uh, 71, but, I think, yeah. Yeah. But uh, he got to see Bob Dylan in concert. I think also The Who. Was I, am I correct? Yep. Yeah. Yep. The Who were there. And uh, yeah, I, I read his memoir in addition to the other research, eh? And I was just captivated by his story. So I had to ask him a number of questions, but I uh, wanted to know more is that he was at the Isle of Wight Festival, which was huge, huge. Yeah. And, and a, a infamous concert where uh, Dylan came on stage in this uh, suit and was shortly after uh, Bob Dylan's motorcycle accident. I, I think this was exactly. like his comeback. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely was after the, the bike accident, but I, I think it was kind of like the first time that they saw him on stage. Yeah. Well, I mean, what a great way of starting off his tour. He went to where? Afghanistan, Turkey, India. Yes. Uh, other countries. I think it was four, was it 14 different countries? Yeah. About, about 14 countries. And maybe because of his experiences in the beginning about losing uh, his uh, traveler's checks, you know, he was kind of forced to, to do a, um, a tour of these countries in a way that maybe if he had money, he wouldn't have experienced all these things. But did you, did you catch the interesting part about the bank guard? Oh, well, I, I wanted to bring that up because that story just hit me because um, I would have to say I'm a lot like that. I like to brighten people's day. And uh, that whole bank guard story was about the doctor uh, walked into this bank and uh, there was a bank guard greeting people. And all he did, he, he basically knew what the bank guard's mission in life was. And that was just to lend a smile, to show, uh, you know, good faith towards others. And uh, I, I, in, in my opinion, just paying it forward and just uh, mm-hmm. putting, a, putting a smile on your face. Absolutely. Yeah, I think he said that uh, it was uh, in the book, I think he said that it was one of his first spiritual guides. I didn't even have a conversation with him, but uh, yeah, I wanted to ask him about his experience or what he, what he saw. Well, uh, he said uh, yeah. he was living in the now, uh, I think was the term he used. And acceptance too. Uh, you yeah. know, acceptance that, uh, you know, that was his job and uh, the guy wanted to do it well. And yeah, I, I mean, later on, I was just kind of um, uh, bowled over by the, the research that this guy's done and how there's a, this connection between chronic fatigue and, and long COVID. All that stuff that we talked about, like, did that answer your question that you had uh, months ago about what it is? I, yeah, like, to my knowledge... I, w- I was never diagnosed with COVID. My wife and I have uh, taken several tests because we didn't feel right at the time. So we, we did the home tests, but uh, the tests always came up negative. We never showed a positive. But I think we're allowed to get tired, Greg, in life. Oh, I, yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. Sometime, and sometimes if we don't look after the mind and body, uh, as you know, I'm going through a lot of stuff right now, personally, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I, I just, I just think that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's run me down a little bit. And so at the beginning of this show today, you asked me, how was I? And I said, well, cause I, yeah, I am tired, but no, uh, this doctor answered, um, a lot of questions today that I had about long COVID and he suspects that. This is still a major concern. Yeah, he was saying that the pandemic is still going on, and uh, yeah, yeah, and there's many people that have long COVID, which you know, as he mentioned, is similar to chronic fatigue syndrome and a number of the symptoms uh, that they um, may have long COVID for a very long time, may not even recover. They may have it for the rest of their life. That was shocking. Another thing he brought up too, uh, uh, I'd like to point out. Uh, he talked about there's certain guides in your life 
Mm -hmm. uh, that'll help you navigate a path through life. It's like letting the universe unfold. There are there there are things that will happen in life, like guides in your life, and they'll help you navigate through through your life along your chosen journey. Mm -hmm. um, what's that phrase of that? Uh, uh, when you need it, a teacher will appear. Right. So yeah, uh, yeah I, I definitely agree that there are people that uh, can help us along the way and and show us the path. But all in all, exactly. I, I like a fascinating, fascinating interview with this guy. Should also point out that uh, his latest book, uh, mostly a memoir, I guess, but it's available on on Amazon. Yes, and he did a uh, an audio book for it too. Yeah. So all of these uh, books and articles that we talked about in this episode will be in the links in the episode description. Mm -hmm. Thanks to our listeners who are Patreon backers. If you'd like to get early access to our episodes and a transcript, you can go to patreon.com backslash mind body matters to join up. It's a couple bucks a month, which isn't, that's not, that's not that much, eh, bro? Hey, I, I've spent uh, $2 in worse ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like this coffee I just picked up at our local coffee shop. I was going to say, you know, the Starbucks coffees are, you know, what, like they're $50 now or something like that. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So yeah, so $2. A couple bucks. Yeah. It's a pittance. Yeah. It's a pittance. And the, uh, a couple of dollars a month surely helps us to continue on uh, with the podcast. We really appreciate everyone's support. Mm -hmm. Mind Body Matters is a great media podcast and produced by Rayford Communications. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, be kind to yourself. And most importantly, be well. Be well.